So we're going to do two panels. Uh, first, we're going to discuss the policy implications of this work. Uh, and then we're going to discuss what it means for companies, big and small. And you're going to find that discussion particularly interesting, I think, because there's a lot of bifurcation. So let me start. Um, let's see. We're going to need, I think, five chairs here. And let me start by introducing our panelists. And as I call you, you can just come up and take a seat. Alan Davidson uh, is the first director of the digital economy at the US Department of Commerce and senior advisor to the Secretary of Commerce. Rob, thank you. Um, <laughs> you can say the clapping till the end. They're, they're all bigwigs. Um, <laughs> Robert Atkinson is the founder and president of ITIF. Uh, Anish Chopra is a former US chief uh, CTO and co-founder and executive vice president of Hutch Analytics, and also an author himself, The Innovative State, How New Technologies Can Transform Government. And finally, Rebecca uh, McKinnon, who's director and ranking digital rights, uh, excuse me, director of ranking digital rights at New America's Open Technology Institute. So thank you all for being here. And the goal of this panel really is to kind of continue to whet everyone's appetite for clearly what are the opportunities and, and challenges, big challenges, of this new era of digitalization and global digitalization. So I'm going to just fire away a few questions, and then we'll have time at the end, and you all can ask some of the panel as well. And Alan, I think I'm going to start with you. Um, and I'll just sort of frame this by saying, uh, Susan shared some sort of amazing big figures outlining what the potential economic benefits are. Um, and you know, we all feel this. We all carry smartphones in our pocket. We see this. Whether we tabulate the data correctly is another topic, perhaps for another um, panel entirely. Um, but there's also some huge challenges uh, to this new era. And just as a journalist, I'm going to put front and center um, the story we've been reading about for the last few weeks, Apple versus the FBI. You know, this is, um, this is one of the potential areas of challenge. Um, a lot of the big technology companies in particular um, have become targets, um, certainly around privacy. There's been conflict um, around, around tax issues, around different kinds of regulation. And I think what it underscores is this idea that you've got companies and countries playing on an entirely new field. So tell us where that's going, and perhaps you know, maybe touch on this Apple case and what it might portend for the future, oh, if no you wish. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the voice Let me of the start president. with the first part of your question. Yeah. <laughs> it might be controversial. You're off, you're off the record. Don't sure, worry. sure. No, uh, thank you. And let me just say, <laughs> uh, first of all, and let me say, first of all, thank you. Thank you to New America and to McKinsey. It's so wonderful to be back here at New America in this incredible space. Uh, I will say thank you to McKinsey for, for both of these reports because um, they, are, uh, they are illuminating for all of us who are following these issues and we rely a lot on them to help us understand what's happening out there. And part of what's happening out there is something, like you said, that we all understand and, and uh, you know, I won't quote McKinsey's numbers back to McKinsey, but we, uh, you know, we see uh, just Commerce Department numbers, $400 billion worth of um, digitally delivered uh, uh, goods coming out, exports out of the United States, and that's a big number for us. Uh, that was in 2014. And so we, you know, we feel this, and I think that uh, a couple of ways to answer your question. One is, um, obviously, these flows are incredibly important. They raise huge new issues, and one of the big issues they raise is that we can't take them for granted, right? That there are many forces out there that now are uh, that may uh, throw some of these flows into jeopardy, especially the model for under which they've taken place—a a relatively free and open digital economy that's allowed for innovation and allowed for a lot of uh, interaction around countries. Uh, and and uh, the the kinds of issues that you're that you, you're mentioning with the Apple case are uh, are basically part of a set of issues that are going to come. Uh, how do we? Uh, as we kind of try to figure out how to protect these data flows and allow for them around the world. I think it fits squarely in there because people are not going to participate in this digital economy if they don't feel like their uh, privacy and security is protected. So it's actually one of the core issues in making sure that data flows can happen. Okay. Um, Rob, I want to bring you into the conversation now. And let's hit particularly on the issues around trade um, because this is, a, this is a huge thing. I know you care a lot about this. We were speaking a little bit earlier um, at lunch about how uh, this new era changes the conversation around trade, um, the kinds of companies that we should be talking about, including that conversation. Why don't you give us your top line views there? Well, I think the top line view is that we're at risk of a new digital mercantilism in the world. And we had a physical mercantilism where companies tried to protect their physical production. Uh, what you're seeing are country after country today, Nigeria, Vietnam, China. I mean, you can just name, name go down the list who have put in place rules that basically require data localization. You cannot send the data outside the country. Uh, now, why do they do that? 
Most of them do it because they're just mercantilists. They think they're going to get some data center jobs, which is sort of fanciful. They're not going to, there aren't a lot of data center jobs. They're much more about the use of data. But the justification, they don't, they don't go to the WTO and say, we're mercantilists. Is this OK? They, they say, we have to have this exception from the WTO principles and philosophy because we're trying to protect our citizens' privacy. And I think this is the single most important point that people have gotten fundamentally wrong in the debate. And I think we didn't quite get it right in TPP, and I, risk, mm -hmm. I think we're going to risk getting it not quite right in TISA. And that is that there is absolutely no increase in privacy or security by keeping data in a country. We wrote a report last year called The False Promise of Data Localization. And when you think about it, let's just think Citibank or General Motors or whatever company doing business in Europe, and they're collecting data on European citizens. And they move the data to Zimbabwe, where it has no privacy laws. They are still subject to European law. They can't avoid European law by moving the data. And I think that's really a simple and fundamental point. You don't have to, governments don't need to worry about where the data are. They just need to worry that they can hold companies accountable. And if a company wants to put data in a place that has bad security, then they will get sued and they should get sued. But the, the location doesn't matter. And I think we have to be much more aggressive in that in our trade negotiations and not even give in. I mean, I, I, TPP was a good step forward. But there were even, in, if you look at the TPP provisions, there are provisions in there that say, and in unusual circumstances, you can do this. I don't think there are very many unusual circumstances. I think we should be very, very strict about that. You know, unless you're like the CIA or something like that. Or I know at one point the president uh, uh, was thinking about do, putting data, you know this, in the cloud. And it's like, yeah, we don't want the president's data stored in China. I get that. <laughs> but for our commercial data, we shouldn't care. Rebecca, you were nodding. Do you agree with this point of view? Well, you know, it's, it's complicated. I mean, def definitely com countries are trying to wall off the internet and data flows for all kinds of reasons. Part of it is mercantilist. Um, it's also political. You know, you have China trying to exert sovereignty over everything that crosses its borders on the internet. Um, and one of the interesting things I, I think from, from this report is China is shown as being very connected. Mm -hmm. Yet at the same time, China is sort of exhibit A for how an authoritarian country sort of adapts to the internet age and doesn't democratize, which is a real challenge to us in that you know, there's, there's conventional wisdom that commerce brings political liberalism. And we're not seeing that. In, in fact, we're seeing models for how a country can avoid that, at least up until now. Um, which brings me to the point. Um, Another organization in this town, Freedom House, a human rights organization, has an annual index um, called the Global Internet Freedom Index. And they have found that over the past five years consistently, the level of internet freedom worldwide has declined. Mm. So as connectivity is growing, actually the rights of internet users and the protection of internet users' rights is declining. That is a huge wet red flag in terms of the level of trust out there on the internet and who's benefiting and how power is being exercised. So you're seeing a growth. So what, what contributes to those figures? The growth of censorship, not just blocking websites or blocking all of Facebook, for instance, but requiring Facebook to take down, you know, requiring companies to take down content, requiring companies to assist with all kinds of censorship, um, you know, sort of monopolies, sort of uneven data flows, control over who has access to what, getting increasingly uneven around the world. Uh, you have a rash of quote unquote cyber crime laws and cyber security laws all over the world. In many countries where crime is defined, to include certain types of religious activity, certain types of critiques of the government. Uh, in Ethiopia, terrorism and journalism are equated, um, and many types of journalism are cybercrime. Um, you, you know, so you have all of this kind of thing happening. You have a growth in intermediary liability, you know, laws that are placing more and more responsibility on the digital platforms and carriers for what their users do which then compels the digital platforms and carriers to police and censor 
and monitor what their your users are doing and, and try and proactively prevent that. And those types of laws and those types of trends are not just in authoritarian countries, but because of concerns about terrorism and so on. We're seeing that more and more uh, in Europe and, and in a range of democratic countries. Uh, and, and again, that makes, that opens it up to abuse. That makes it harder, particularly for small players, um, that when you're talking about who is benefiting from the digital economy, um, if you're trying to have open government, you're trying to be you know, anti-corruption, you're trying to enable people to, to really you know, have open discourse about what types of policies benefit everyone. And when those who are incumbents in a particular country can utilize their power over networks to silence critics or silence aspects of the policy debates, including economic policy debates, including regulatory debates about who, you know, uh, whether small businesses can thrive, um, you know, that's, that's a problem. So you've touched on a lot here, and we're going to come back actually in the next panel to this issue of the kinds of companies that are benefiting and the different players that are benefiting in this new age. Um, I'm reminded actually of that uh, fabulous heat map that I know James loves uh, that, that shows from the McKinsey data the, the different industries that are most digitalized and least. And government is way down here oh, in man. this sector. Yeah, loving it. Loving it. <laughs> so I'm teeing you up, yes. Adish. <laughs> what, well, can, what can government do? Well, it's, here's an important, uh, we, we just spent the first few minutes talking about one of three dimensions in the role of government on this issue. Uh, regulating and engaging on rules of the road in the internet economy, that's Alan's life. He's all over this for the secretary. But there are two others. One, we're always investing in infrastructure. And the modern version of infrastructure is increasingly digital. Um, the smart grid, electronic health records, even mobile broadband in, in much larger domains. So we're actively investing in the assets that are then throwing off or opening up capacity for uh, the digital economy. But more importantly, uh, we are looking at the ways we solve big problems, health, energy, education. And increasingly, you can't solve those problems unless you can connect to digital assets that can make better use. I, the former uh, Deputy Secretary of Education and I, I remember this vividly, we had a summit of education technology entrepreneurs. I know it was so boisterous and everybody had ideas and learning labs and ways to teach calculus in new ways. And uh, then we got the crickets chirping when they said, how many of them got contracts from any you know, US schools? And they're like, oh, procurement, can't get anyone. To, it's like, where are you making any money? How many of you sold your first dollar revenue overseas? Every single hand of every education technology entrepreneur because, and I remember vividly going to India in preparation for the president's trip, I went to a, a hut, no paved roads, no uh, any modern forms of infrastructure, but a hut that got a, a, a broadband, a fiber connection. And the village said, I wonder if we could use Khan Academy and other open education resources to complement the absent teacher that doesn't show up for the school to get folks uh, math trained. And you. If you want to be the president of a country that wants to educate the population to compete in the 21st century, you will be begging the educational technology entrepreneurs, the access to open education resources. You will want that flow while you may get mad at Instagram for some kind of imaging that you don't want to have propagated in your country. So if you look at the role of government in all three of these dimensions, there's an unwavering trend towards this very goal that uh, we saw uh, uh, clearly. And uh, to me, it's the new default for the president. President Obama said, now, by default, all data sets held by the government shall be made publicly available in machine-readable form, increasingly by APIs, which is the method by which all these apps shake hands and exchange information. How about that, Alan Davidson? Thank you. You can see why Anish was blazing the trail for us here, right? Uh, our pathbreaker. Uh, by the way, feel free to interact together and interrupt each other politely. Um, uh, all right, let, let me just continue Can with, make one point yeah, minute please, to, uh, yeah, go ahead. To, to Rob, yeah. here's an interesting point. He, he kind of hurt a little bit. You guys didn't fight hard on trade. Okay, a little friendly, friendly, friendly banter. I will say this. When we published our cybersecurity framework back in 2010, one of the most important provisions on this was we said no state governments shall hold data localization requirements mm -hmm. because we wanted to eat our own dog food because we absolutely agree with what Rob was saying. So when the president spoke clearly in the domestic context, it was very clear no lines between states on you have to have a data center in North Carolina versus Virginia, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So that precedent has been laid. 
I want to I want to actually put out a big kind of meta topic again around trade, um, but also around the perception of the labor consequences of this new age of globalization. Um, so we've all been talking about the incredible opportunities for small business people. I mean, my father, for example, is a, a Midwestern um, small manufacturing firm owner who has a lot more global business now, in part because of what we're talking about. Yet, uh, as we see in the current um, uh, political campaigns, there's this perception that this is all kind of scary, that it's, it's bad for workers. Um, in some ways, it feels like we are um, talking about a previous age of, of globalization and, and trade discussion. We don't really know completely what the new age is going to look like. Um, how, Alan, let me come to you again. How should we be reframing uh, the trade discussion based on the opportunity and the challenges now? I mean, the first part is, uh, and I'm still in line in some ways from Rob here too, which is that you know, we have to retool the way we think about trade, right? I mean, the fact is that we have huge apparatus that's designed to think about trade in, the, in, in these old world contexts, not thinking about the, the, the trillions of dollars that's now being, uh, uh, that's now happening in, these, in, the digital, in the digital world. And I'll say, we see this at the Commerce Department. We're kind of racing to try to do this. We have divisions of, you know, we have a Deputy Assistant Secretary for textiles. We have no Deputy Assistant Secretary for anything digital. Um, and uh, we're, 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 we're working on it, and we will be working on it, but I think that's, you know, that's part of our retooling, and that's something that the entire government, and this is, you know, this is where folks like Anisha are. Having a chief technology officer, a relatively new concept, right? Mm -hmm. Now it seems like how could we live without it, right? Um, so I think there's a huge part of that. But also, to, we need to, we, part of that is also, though, about asking um, two really hard questions about new technology. One is, um, is this question raised about are we, are we building these t tools in a way uh, that really includes everybody, right? And so part of that is that the access work and uh, uh, all the work that happens to make sure that people are online. But part of that is also about skill building. The second big question is, are we actually, is, is, is our society building technologies uh, that are actually serving human progress? Well, and, and that is a much harder question to answer. And we're not necessarily the right people to answer it all the time. But I will say that one thing that we can do is, as government is try to catalyze a conversation early on when these technologies are coming out. For example, we're doing a project right now on uh, driverless cars. We're doing another project on the Internet of Things. Both of these things are things that are going to really have massive impacts. If we can be thinking early on in the development life cycle while these technologies are being built and deployed in the industry, how we can start to address the incredible like disruptions that are coming and wonderful things that will come from these things, we actually might be able to get ahead of it, but it's a lot of work. Well, and you're touching on something important, which is how is government going to compensate from, uh, for the disruption, the dislocation that's going to happen, not just at the, the, the lower socioeconomic part of the labor uh, chain, but, but the middle and even the upper. I mean, actually, James, I'm remembering, we were sitting, James and I were sitting in, in Davos having a conversation together, and someone came in we, about this topic, and someone came in to serve us coffee, and you were saying, you know what? Our jobs are going to be disrupted, because our analytical skills can be done by computers. His job will be harder to disrupt. So uh, there, there's a really wide right. spectrum. Right. Yeah, <laughs> I know. That's pretty good, right? Um, it, there's a wide spectrum of, of dislocation. What can government do? What is government doing? What should government do? Um, and maybe you can I, jump I, in, Anish, I too. would just say earlier this year, year ago, what it was, uh, if the same technologies were applied to the labor market, then you could actually solve this challenge. I mean, one of the most frustrating questions that uh, if you look at the articles about minority students in Harlem that were qualified, overqualified to get into Harvard, but didn't even know or thought to apply because the guidance counselor infrastructure didn't encourage it. Or the H&R Block study that said, while I might be aware that I might qualify for subsidies, if H&R Block, the study that was uh, referenced here as a digital asset, could access my IRS transcript and or could connect digitally to the FAFSA on my behalf, the mere fact that they, as a digital coach, got me applied uh, with my permission, eight minutes of time from the advisor, 8% more people finished college uh, as a result of this one minor intervention, uh, according to the, uh, you know, to the risk pool. So to me, this fundamental question is, if every human being lives up to their fullest potential and could be like a GPS router encouraged to pursue this degree and get this certificate, and if you want to live in this neighborhood, here are the jobs that are coming, and here's the skills that are demanded, and if you want to move, this is what you can do, 
every single day, we should be getting an inbox letter that says, you were put on this earth to perform these jobs. And how exciting would you feel if you got such a message, <laughs> right? And, and opening up labor market data might foster more and more of those technologies to be brought to bear to advance your, your goals. Rob, you wanted to jump in on this? Yeah, I get that email every morning. It says you should run a think tank. <laughs> so like, it really works for me quite well. Um, so I think the issue is here is, is the difference between perception and reality. And perception is the only thing that matters. That's what's driving this. And there's a perception that we're all at risk. We read these stories. You know, any day now, there's going to be think tank automation from Google and no more think tanks. And the reality, though, which I think we have to You're recognize. I haven't read an article about a think tank automation wave, yeah. but I hear you. We're working on it. <laughs> we're going we're to be the platform that sells it. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> sorry, New America, disrupt I'm just yourself. saying. Uh, you're gonna disrupt yourself. That's yeah, the, you, uh, that's yeah, the you gotta disrupt yourself, right. otherwise that's, someone that's will do it role. for you, as Christensen <laughs> right. would say. But anyway, the reality is there hasn't been an increase in disruption. There's been a shift in where it is, but there hasn't been an increase in it. And I actually think if we're sort of putting a bet on, what are we gonna worry about more, disruption or lack of disruption? In other words, lack of productivity. I worry more about that. I think you know, they, that's what your study showed is what you see are a bunch of firms, a few firms that are doing really well. They're figuring it all out. They're putting all the pieces together and doing well. And a lot of other firms and a lot of industries not doing that. I think that's one of the central questions. And then the question for that to me, which is a policy question, is how are we going to think about that? So you've got a bunch of firms doing really, really well, a bunch of firms that sort of haven't figured it out. If you look at what Europe just announced, their approach is, there are these digital moors. We're going to make the digital moors give some of their digital to the digital lesses. But seriously, that's what the commission now is trying to do. They're trying to do antitrust and other competition policies that would force companies to give their data away. And it's this notion that we, we don't want this kind of thing. We want this kind of thing. And so we're going to bring down the top so that they're equal, kind of Algernon Bergeron story. And, Kurt Vonnegut, if you remember that. And I think that would be a huge mistake. And I, th I think what we have to recognize in the digital era is it leads to a sort of bimodalism. And it lead, it's going to lead to scale. It's going to lead to firms getting incredible scale. And we shouldn't be afraid of that. And it's going to lead, as Donna will talk about, a bunch of opportunities for really fast-growing, globalized gazelles from day one, which is fantastic. But I don't think we should fight that. I think we, we don't want everybody in the middle. I think that's, a, that's being stuck in the middle is where you don't get the growth. Sure, and, and maybe tying it back to the question Alan punted on at the beginning about Apple. And, um, but it, be, because I think this, this relates to sort of corporate interests versus government interests and, and large firms, large global firms. I think we're increasingly seeing companies like Apple, but you, know, you could create a long list, Google, Facebook, et cetera, whose interests are increasingly divergent from those of even their home country governments, let, let alone clashing with other, other governments that are, are trying to you know, break them up or make them do this or that. Um, but Apple has, you, know, you increasingly have large multinational digital companies with global constituencies. And so they view their interests as more, you know, why is Apple standing up to the FBI? Because they're playing to their global user base. Right, and that's what they're concerned about. You know, th there's principle involved as well. There's lots of different facets of this, but their interests are not the same as the U.S. government's interests anymore, and not the same as the U.S. public's necessarily. You know, and, and so in increasingly, you're seeing these big firms that just have these global, international interests, and in some countries. Um, you know, when Steve Jobs died in Iran, people were out there mourning, and you know there was a political cartoonist saying, you know, we're mourning this guy's death more than we would the passing of so and so and so and so. And and you know the the reason is that people see in these technologies opportunities that their own governments aren't giving them, and and so so these cross cutting kind of constituencies for corporate corporate governed and created sort of communities. Yeah. Um, I think is, is a force that, that both the commercial implications and the geopolitical implications yeah. that, that, you know, we, we don't quite I, know I what I actually they're completely be. agree with you. Alan, do you want to come back on this? Well, I just was going to say, I, I wouldn't overstate the divergence between the interests of the U.S. government and the broader uh, economy uh, and the, the firms in the economy, because I do think 
while there might there are local disturbances, the fact is that uh, as a first order approximation, we are we work very hard with and with with U.S. firms to try to uh, to promote promote this digital economy. And I will say, I'm, I come back to kind of a point I was making at the beginning about um, the fact that we can't take the current situation for granted. I mean, we are out there, as Rob was saying, every day looking at new data localization rules, new kinds of restrictions on uh, on these cross-border data flows. Uh, we just went through a, a big issue at the Department of Commerce on uh, the what they call the EU-US Privacy Shield, this agreement about privacy uh, uh, and the transfer of data between, the Euro, between Europe and the US. It's ongoing. We reached a big agreement, extremely important, protecting hundreds of billions of dollars of trade between the US and Europe. But it just shows that if we don't get these things right, right, this, there's a lot that can jeopardize these flows, and, there, and there's a lot of harm that comes from that. Point. Um, and uh, Nisha, I'll come back to you. But I actually, Rebecca, this is a, I think you've hit on kind of the hot core, really, of, of this topic. Globalization used to be defined as free movement of uh, goods, capital, and labor. Now we're adding digital flows to that. Um, but as James was explaining, as I think the data shows, everybody's feeling pretty good about this except the labor part and possibly some overlap with the citizen part. Um, so that's a huge kind of existential challenge that no matter how hard you're working at it, it's there and it's not going away. Anish, do you want to comment well, on that? I know we're running near the end of the time. My, my only comment would simply be, <laughs> where, I would make one observation, which is your favorite map, James's map of these sectors that are failing us, it, it, it moves from the abstract to the practical. Why is healthcare near the bottom of your list? Utilities, et cetera. It's because we haven't quite unified the rules of the road on data liquidity in this environment. I literally just came from the president, just literally mic dropped the mic around a story around patients having access to their own data. Mm -hmm. So in this case, they could contribute to research to find uh, new cures and diseases. But what's amazing now is that the regulatory structure is thinking of this as a new muscle. The, the, I would leave you with this final thought of the digital economy. What's the least understood but has the most potential impact part of Dodd-Frank on the digital economy? The regulatory authority given to the Consumer Protection Bureau to regulate how consumers can get machine-readable access to their transaction-level data in financial services, James. And we do not yet have consensus in the community as to what Regu what regulations and standards the CFPB should promulgate on the banks in our system. Could you imagine a more important topic on the digitization of the global economy than to get the financial flows moving through the consumer? Right? Yeah. And I think in health and energy and education, we're consistently describing the fact that the new default in regulation is to the consumer and then to the consumer's designated applications. And that's this new chapter, which I think this is uh, all coming okay, on we're right. Give quick last word, and then we're going to have one or two questions. And if one were to go to the yeah. Department of Commerce website and see the digital economy agenda that's recently been posted about uh, our forward-looking agenda, you would see four parts to it. One is protecting cross-border data flows, but the other three are promoting trust and security and privacy, promoting access and skill building, and promoting innovation in new technology. And the reason is you can't have the first one without getting the other ones right. So I totally agree. We've got to look at it in a global environment. Okay. Lots of interesting stuff here. We have time for literally two questions. Gentlemen here. Mike Nelson with Cloudflare. I learned a new word last week. It's called incumbation. It's what incumbents do to stop innovation. Ooh, love it. <laughs> Tweeting that later. I would challenge McKenzie <laughs> to do a study on this and then correlate <laughs> how incumbation compares to growth in digitization in different countries around the world. So my question for the panel is, what are the most important things we could do to prevent incumbation. Uh, my favorite is stopping some of the lawsuits and maybe doing something about IPR, but I'd, I'd just like okay. to see what you would do, think do we a, could do. Let's do a flash round quickly. Alan, do you want to start? Um, I would just say uh, I, I, I think promoting this openness on, online that makes it easy, permissionless innovation uh, is, the, is the starting point, and that's really the motivator for a lot of this. So I think there's a mythology out there that in the income, whatever it is, are, uh, are the big firms against the little firms. Actually, in most cases, it's actually little firms protecting their little thing against big e-commerce players who have scale. You see that over and over. And the biggest place that plays out in our economy is at the state legislative level and the state regulatory barred level. And I think federal government could, at minimum, something you could do, Al, start a scorecard, uh, a scorecard of, sort of regula regulatory. <laughs> I, I like to joke that. 
the uh, commission is doing a digital single market. We need a digital single market in the U.S. And that's one of the barriers to it are these state laws. At least begin a scorecard. Okay. Yes. Uh, again, <laughs> regulating that the consumer has the data rights on any sector that's regulated gives us a default. So even if I'm held by an incumbent, I can pull it out and get a second opinion by someone I trust. Transparency and open information, very right here, similar. Yep. <laughs> okay, last question right here. So if we're trying to change the narrative, if we're trying, trying to change the narrative and we have, if you can argue that the benefits of globalization and digitalization are huge but diverse, where the, the risk to an individual is very personal and very painful. So it is difficult, it seems, to fight kind of protectionist tendencies in the US these days to go for globalization and go for digitalization. How do you deal with diverse but massive benefits and communicating with individuals who they lost their job and they don't think globalization is good? So, so yeah, how do you balance kind of the data points with the, the, the touch factor of, hey, this doesn't feel great to me right now, this disruption. Anish, do you want to start well, with that? I, first principles, rebuilding the social safety net. We have disruption. I lived in Virginia, served in the governor's cabinet. The North Carolina-Virginia border has been decimated by textile and other uh, uh, you know, outsourcing to China. And our inability to build any thoughtful response, we've given people some short-term benefits, cash benefits, but to really think about how they can leapfrog in to, to build a better life for their families. We've weakened their capacity on broadband. We've weakened, the, weakened their ability to access uh, advanced placement courses. We've weakened the capacity for them to get access to telemedicine services. So my opinion is you got to reimagine the social safety net for those who are dis dislodged and make sure that they have every chance uh, to uh, the, in the income mobility question through digitization, I think, is a faster path to the other end as opposed to the source of the disruption. Anybody else want to have a final word on this? So, so I think two things. One is we should just stop the, the, the sort of pundits, of which I would put myself in that category, should just stop the narrative that, uh, that automation destroys jobs on net. It does not. It doesn't. I, I mean, I just, how many McKinsey studies have shown that? Thank you. It just doesn't, okay? It, it does not destroy jobs on net. It destroys particular jobs, but it doesn't lead to, and I think that's number one. Let's just get that in our consciousness and our dialogue. Number two, it's just a real simple thing. If you look at unemployment insurance, the amount that people get as a share of their wages, it is way, way down from what it was 30 years ago. So if you lose your job and you have a UI for six months, you're going to get very little. And, and there are some states that are just like, they give you pennies almost. And I think, I know the president's tried to do that. You can't do it with, the, with Congress right now. But a sort of federal floor on unemployment insurance would be, uh, I think, a really important step forward. Well, we haven't solved the future of the nation state in the era of digital globalization, but I think you've whet everybody's appetite for more. So thank you to all of our panelists.